But it's great to be with you, Lifehouse. Those of you who are watching for maybe the very first time, welcome as well. This is my friend Julian. Uh, he's a great young man that we love in this place. And there's a few of us just here bringing the Word of God to you. And I pray that uh, lockdown, if that's what you are experiencing, that I pray it has treated you well. Um, and I know that for some of you, you are the, the locks, lockdowns just do not phase you because it doesn't affect any area of your life. But then there are those of us where it just completely messes everything up. And we just pray that during this time that you guys are getting through this winning and, uh, and staying positive. You know, it is difficult to stay positive when your football team should have won a football game quite easily. So I'm trying to get all the unforgiveness out of my heart and the disappointment right now. Um, and so for those of you who barrack for the North Melbourne Football Club, um, good luck with that. Okay, what are you going to do with that win anyway? Like, why not just give it to us? You guys have got no chance. Why wouldn't you have just succumbed and just handed it over? Give us a chance, guys. 1995. Come on, guys. Preach it, somebody. And that's what I came to tell you guys today. Have a fantastic day. No, just kidding. Come on. Hey, we are in the middle of our series called God, Money, and Me. And thank you so much for those of you who have uh, reached out and sent me some text messages via uh, the different platforms to encourage us as a church to, to tell us that you really feel like you're learning something and being encouraged in the area of your finances. So come on, why don't you just bow your heads with me? I'm going to be bringing the next installment today, and, uh, and I'm praying for revelation. Father, I thank you for everyone that is watching right across the world, Father God, in our magnificent country that we call Australia. And Father God, I just specifically pray for those who call Lifehouse home, Father, that you would really bless them. Father God, they've tuned in today so that they can hear from you. So I pray you would use this man and use your word, God, to bring a revelation today. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, we have got a few people here and I've encouraged them to yell out and scream because they need to make up for your yelling and screaming and clapping. And uh, so we're going to have some fun here today. Is it okay if we have some fun here today? Okay, come on, life's a bit serious at the moment. Okay, someone needs to just inject some, some, some spontaneity, a bit of humor uh, in, into, into this madness. Okay, but, uh, but God's going to do some great things here. Yeah, someone said, please don't use the word inject. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's all, too, tra it's all tra too traumatizing. Okay, all right, guys, God, money, me, um, and, and today, what I'm going to be speaking to you about, if you've read Pastor Paul de Jong's book, which is what we're basing our series on, um, today I'm going to be talking to you about the four buckets, okay? The four buckets, which is basically the pathway to financial prosperity, making sure that you're moving forward. And uh, now let me just start all over again by saying, because, because it's been interesting this week, actually, uh, when I counsel people. Friends, let me make this really clear. One of the major issues that often troubles relationships and causes devastation and destruction is finances and the pressure upon that couple, whether she may want to step back and have some children and, and not necessarily want to go back to work, the pressure that puts on a family, uh, the misuse of money, the overspending, the gambling in some, in some cases. Friends, money matters to families, to individuals, to a young adult uh, thinking about their future. Money does matter. Let's, let's, let's not pretend that it doesn't, okay? Come on. Um, let's, let's not do that. Actually, this is what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy. Hey, you're going to really learn some things today. I'm really excited about this message. I'm going to plow through these four buckets. I'm going to go through them as quickly as I can so that we can really delve into each one of them and, and not just sort of concentrate on one of them. Um, but this is what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy. He says, but people who long, sorry, this is Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, 1 Timothy. It says, people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Now, let me just stop right there because that's what some people think we're doing right now. They think this whole series is about us longing for finances. Friends, nothing could be further from the truth. What the Apostle Paul is talking about here when he says you're being tempted, you're being trapped by harmful desires, he actually tells us what it is that causes that. In verse 10 he says, for the love, the love 
of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Friends, this whole series is not to make us fall in love with money. It's to ensure that we don't and that we control money, not that money controls us. And, and, and that's what this whole series is about. He says, and some people craving money. Hey, friends, let's not crave money because this is what then applies to us if we do. It says, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Friends, can I make something really clear to you? Don't chase money. Chase God. We've often said, keep money out of your heart and God will keep it in your heart pocket. Come on, someone needs to say amen, okay? This is not a series about loving money, okay? There are some people who have, uh, seriously, I've heard around the traps, they're saying, why is our church doing a series about loving money? What church do you go to? What are you listening to? That's not what we're saying in this place. We're saying money does matter to you. It does. It affects every area of your life, and we're trying to say, let's put money in its proper place place because it is a great servant, but it is a terrible master. Okay, prisons are full of people who have made money their master, therefore they do what money says, and sometimes money makes you do crazy things. And so let me just make this statement right off the bat. I haven't, started even, I haven't even started talking about the four things yet, but just w- wait for this. Some people think that we shouldn't be prospering, but the funny thing is, you know, in, in, in the past, you know, there was a certain lady Now, of course, I would never mention her name, but let's just talk about the spirit behind this. She was saying, I don't think people should prosper. You know, we shouldn't be talking about money, and and, and I get it. I, I understand what she's trying to say, yet that same person was down here at our church taking out a whole lot of meals that people in our church had paid for. So people out of their prosperity had given to the Lifehouse Kitchen so that we can be a blessing. There it is, friends. People have given so that we can be a blessing. And this person who feels that people shouldn't be blessed was very happy to come down here and pick up some meals that people paid for. Listen, what am, what am I trying to say? Let's not bow to the spirit of poverty. Friends, that's a poverty mentality. And I don't believe that. And I know this is going right around the world and it might seem a bit harsh. But friends, let me tell you what, what that spirit will do. It will cause us to not be a blessing to our community. It will cause us to not be able to bless anybody. So I'm not going to bow to that spirit. I do believe that God has called us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. And I know that right across Australia, people are clapping and screaming and yelling. And for those of us who may be feeling like, you know what, maybe, maybe he's talking to me. Hey, listen, come on, just make a decision. God, I'm going to let your word speak louder than my own thoughts. Amen. Let, let me just give this last illustration. Um, you know, Often as as Christians, we can be people who are really good at praying to receive a miracle. Hey, the other day I was praying for God to give me a car and God gave me a car. Hey, listen, we celebrate with you, amen. Amen, that's wonderful that you were praying for a miracle for yourself. That's wonderful, great. Do you know, I was was running a life group for a few years and it used to shock me when we used to have prayer time that these people, because they were so financially stable and moving forward, do you know they would never pray for a miracle for themselves? What they used to pray was, Father, help me to be a blessing to others. They used to pray that they could be the answer to somebody's miracle. So let, let me ask you a question. Are you the sort of person that where you, you, you think God is wonderful because he, he grants you your desires? Or, or, or are you that next level where you are able to help to, through God's blessing, to help other people receive their desires. Come on, what are we believing for? For you to receive a car or for you to give away a car? Are you hearing me? Are you believing for a house or to be able to give away a house? Come on, let's rise up. Let's not dumb this thing down to the lowest denominator. Come on, it is important. And so we're gonna be speaking about these things. Now, let's learn some money principles right up front, guys, okay? You know, they say that people who win the lottery often lose it within a few years. Why? Because they didn't build wealth themselves. They were just given wealth and they didn't know how to take care of it, steward it, and make it move forward. So this is what Proverbs 21 verse 5 says. It says, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. Can you believe that? It says, but hasty shortcuts lead 
to poverty. So come on, we're not going to be the sort of people that are going to be thinking, oh, one little series and everything's going to change overnight. No, it's probably not going to happen that way. You're going to build line upon line. You're going to build the foundation first. Then we're going to build the frame. Then we're going to put a roof on this thing. And then we're going to fill that house with furniture. Friends, wealth comes slowly. It often comes slowly. Now, there might be some circumstances out there where God doesn't do it that way, but that's how God wants us to build. Now, pastoring a church in the side of town that we do, and maybe who knows where people are from, I always need to make this statement, Proverbs 13, verse 11, the Bible says, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Friends, in other words, we don't need to do things in an illegal manner to be blessed. We can't limit God. Okay, if you're running a cafe, you can't say to yourself, the only way I can run this cafe is to pay people in cash. The only way that we can run this business is to buy things illegally and then resell them. Friends, no. We serve a God who says you can do things in an honest fashion and that you can do all the right things that our government requires using even the legal loopholes, okay? But we are going to build little by little. And again, someone needs to say, Amen. Come on. Okay, so let's, let's get to these four buckets, okay? These, uh, now, I'm, I'm going to be using Pastor Paul's uh, packaging of this, this whole concept. And there's, he's, he's used uh, the, the letter S to represent each one of these buckets. And the first one, guys, now we know this one. We know this one is stewardship. So what does that mean? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says this. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Everyone repeat after me. Say the word impossible. It's impossible to please God without faith because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Friends, what's the first bucket that we really need to give very careful attention to? Friends, how do we bring finances under God? How do we bring faith into our finances. Well, the Bible tells us very clearly, Proverbs 3, 9, it says, honor the Lord with your possessions, okay, and with the first fruits of your increase. Friends, let me be very clear. The Bible makes it really clear that God wants the first of your first fruits, the first of your income. Now, in the Bible, we call that a tithe, which simply means a tenth. Now, for a lot of us, we all want to do what God asks us to do. But friends, I know lots of people who struggle with that. And then I know those who just simply do it because God says it. And friends, over 30 years, I have seen the blessing that comes when people put God first in their finances. Why the tithe? What is the tithe? Well, let me tell you what it's not. The tithe is not a tenth. Well, should I say it's not the eighth tenth. Okay, or the ninth tenth. It's the first tenth. Why the first tenth? Because, guys, what we're saying to God is, Father, here's my money. I want to honor you first. Why? Because God always wants to be first. Now, that should not shock us because I'm married to a lovely lady and I want to be first in her life and she wants to be first in my life. Actually, in a relationship, when you don't put each other first, okay, it's a recipe for disaster. If you're a married couple and all of a sudden the dad or mum decide to put the children first, friends, that's not, a, that, that's not the way to do marriage. No, 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 you should always keep your partner first. Where do we get that from? Where does that mentality come from? Where does that desire come from? It comes from God who wants to be the first in our finances. He wants to be first with our time. He wants to be first with our treasure. He wants to be first. He wants to be first. He wants the first of your day. He wants the first of your heart. He wants the first. So why wouldn't our finances fall under the same category? Well, it does, friends. It does. And so we see here in Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Here it is. For those of you who have never maybe read this before, here it comes. It says, bring the whole tithe, that's the tenth, into the storehouse. What is that? Today, it's God's church, that there may be food in my house. What's he saying? Guys, bring in your first fruit so that I can then, through the church, be a blessing to our society. Can you imagine when a whole church does this, how much of a blessing we can be to our society? Hey, Pastor Richard, we really want to impact our community. Great. 
Make sure you're giving a first of your income to God so that we can do that. Amen. When we do what God says to do, then we can do what God asks us to do. Amen. He's, and then God says, test me in this. The only time you see the words, test me in this, in the Bible. The only time you are allowed to test God is in your finances. That's how powerful this thing is. God says, test me. How, how small do you think I am is what God is saying. He says, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Now, friends, we live in a digital age where really God could give us billions of dollars and we could afford to store it. But this was back in the day when your wealth was calculated by the amount of flocks you had or the wheat you had or whatever else. You know, the amount of grapes you had. And you used to reach limits because you just had nowhere else to store it. And God is saying, hey, listen, I'm going to give you more than enough, is what he's saying. I'm going to get you to the place where you've got more than enough that you could then become a blessing. So friends, as we start to talk about these four buckets, friends, the first one, and I would hope it's a given. I know many of you are saying, yeah, yeah, get on with it. We know this one. We're already doing it. And, and, and you're fully convinced of the word of God. But there is somewhere you haven't crossed that line yet. And, and, and we're about to move into the next three. But I, I've got to tell you something. God makes it pretty clear that without that first tenth, it's very difficult for him to bless the other 90. And I want you to be blessed, friends. This whole series is about you being blessed. And, and, and I've made that very clear, friends. I would never expect you to give something you have not got. How do I get God's people to prosper? Let's do what God says. Now, Helen and I, we are testament to, we've been tithing our whole life. And I've got to tell you, I don't think we've gone without. I've seen many Christians who have done what God has said. They haven't gone without. Friends, some people would say, I can't afford to tithe. I would say, you can't afford not to. Come on, get your finances under God's blessing. Amen? Come on, get excited. Here we go, number two. Now, this is a, to me, the first one was a given. The second one is where I think a lot of people falter, okay? And, and we call it seed. So the first one is stewarding. The second bucket is seeding. Now, what does that mean? Well, Proverbs 11 verse 24 says this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. What is seeding? Friends, it's your generosity. It's your generosity. And I've got to tell you, that first tenth, it belongs to God. But do you know what you decide to do with that next bucket, the seeding bucket? Friends, that's your generosity. You don't have to do that. You don't have to. You can just simply say, God, here's, here's your tithe, and I refuse to do anything else. Hey, you can go ahead and do that. But for those who decide, no, I'm going to be generous, friends, the Bible tells us that what you're actually doing is you're sowing seeds of generosity. Now, I've got to tell you, come on, let's be honest. The people I love being with are not the people who do things out of obligation, the people I love going to dinner with are not the people who say, oh, well, I guess it's my time to have to pay for this meal. No, please, don't pay for the meal, please, if that's your attitude. No, no, come on, we all love being around people who are generous. Why? Because it is a God-like attribute. And I would love to see all of us guys rise up in our seeding. Now, let me tell you something. Seeding can be towards your church, amen, that's wonderful, that's, that's fantastic, and we see a lot of people do that with our miracle offering. But friends, it's not limited to your church. It's you looking across the road and seeing a neighbor who maybe their lawnmower has broken down and you know they can't afford it, so you go and take their lawnmower, you go get it serviced for them, and, and, you, and you invest in some people. Friends, that's seeding. But friends, if you don't put money aside for that, it will never happen. You will never feel like you've got the resource to do that. So here's the challenge to all of us. How's your seeding bucket going? Are you purposely being generous? Do you remember I started this series by saying, what would you believe if you simply read the Bible, simply read it, and you believed everything that you read, that you had what it said you had, that you were who it says you are? If, if you just read your Bible without anybody giving you their opinion, what would you believe about the Bible? Well, you know what? You would read Proverbs 11.25, and this is what it says. 
Come on, read it with me. Are you ready? It's coming up on the screen. Here it comes. A generous person will prosper. So as the pastor of Lifehouse Church, I want you desperately to prosper. So I can only go by what the Bible says. And if I want you to prosper, I've got to teach you to be generous. Because the Word of God says that, and whoever refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. I love that. Proverbs 29, 2 says, uh, 22 verse 9, sorry, it says, the generous themselves will be blessed, okay? For they share their food with the poor. Proverbs 112 verse 5, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely who conduct their affairs with justice. Friends, if we've only got the word of God to go by, I need to encourage you to really fill up your second bucket. Be generous, friends. Be generous. You know, last week I was telling you about a friend of mine. And uh, whether you know who it is or you don't, it doesn't bother me. But, but you know, he, he's got no problem with me sharing these stories. But I'm going to leave his name out of it, okay? But I was telling you last week how I've got a great friend who, you know, he, he continued to pay his gym membership when the gym was closed down because he thought it's probably going to matter more to them than it does to him. Well, that's just the way he lives, this guy. He's just generous. He just, it's, God's blessed him and he just continues to be generous. Well, you know what? He works for an organization and this organization has a franchise. And when you buy a franchise, usually it costs you a lot of money. But this organization, because of who he is and the way he runs business, they decided to just simply give him a franchise. They just gave him a franchise. Just literally, here, have it. Friends, to the value of around $5 million. He, just, he basically got given $5 million. And I said to him, how do you feel about that? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's great. It just, he, was, he was feeling blessed, but I could tell already he's already thinking, how am I going to bless others? Yeah. Come on take, on, take on a spirit of generosity, friends. Why do we, why do we think that, that, that God is so small that as we give out to others, he can't continually fill us? Come on, you've got to decide, are you going to be a river or are you going to be a dam? Woo. I want to be a river. I want God to just flow through me, and, 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 and I, I just want to be generous. Hey, let me just give you an, another little uh, story that I read about not long ago. You know, the, the, the world record as such for the longest paying it forward, okay? Some of you may remember this story. Somebody went to Starbucks one day, and they bought their cappuccino, and they said, hey, listen, I want to buy a cappuccino or whatever. I want to pay for the, 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 the drink for this guy behind me or the girl or whoever it was. So they paid an extra $10. And so that person could order whatever they wanted. So that person then stepped up and the cashier said, hey, I just want to let you know your drink has been paid for. So then they took that drink and they said, well, I want to pay for the person behind me. So then that person took their drink. They stepped up again. The next person says, hey, your drink's been paid for. What? Really? Yeah, 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 your drink's been paid for. Okay, so they took that drink, and then they paid for the person behind them. You know what? 10 people, 20 people kept paying it forward to the person behind them. So really paying it backwards. No, paying it forward, but paying it backwards, right? Did you know that went on? Not for 100 people, not 200 people, not 300 people. Listen. 378 people kept paying it forward. I think 370, but do you know what that tells me? There was a 379th person who stepped up and said, what, really, free drink? Yeah, yeah it's, been, it's free. Some of the person before you paid for your drink and, and somebody went, oh, that's great, and walked off. Now, you know what, friend, don't let that be you. I don't know who that person was, but don't let that be you. Because they were standing in the queue. Wait, listen to it. They were standing in the queue. They obviously thought they had to pay for the drink. So it's not like they were broke. But they simply received without giving. They were going to pay. Why didn't they just pay for the person? You know, that should still be going on today. And it should be up to like, you know, 10,464 people or something, right? But no, someone decided, I'm just going to take and not give. Don't let that be you, friends, because let me assure you, right now in life, there's a lot of giving going on in your world, as in people are giving to you. Make sure it goes through you. Amen? So the first bucket is stewarding. Let's steward what God has given to us. Let's put him first. The second thing is seeding. Let's make sure 
that we are constantly allowing money to go through, through us, amen? And it's not just money, friends, it's every area of our life. Now, number three, this is, this is a big one. Save, save. Now, here it goes. Can you please hear my heart here? Because we've just talked about being generous. Hear my heart. Please, in Jesus' name, do not give everything away. Oh, but you know, I feel like I'm being more spiritual because, no, 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 it's very unbiblical to give everything away. Oh, no, no, because Jesus said, you know, sell up everything you've got and give it to the poor. Yeah, he, he, he said that to one man. He said that to one person at one time. Now, if God the Holy Spirit tells you, you do whatever he tells you to do, okay? But what I find happens is people give everything away and then we end up having to help them, okay? No, that's not, that's not great stewardship, friends. No, no, make sure you know how to save. Now, listen, why is this important? Because it's about generations, friends. There are, you've got children and you're gonna have grandchildren and we've got to make sure we are setting them up. Actually, this is what Proverbs 13, 22 says. Come on, you need to listen up here. This may be messing with some of your religious minds right now, okay? But hear me out here. This is what the Bible says. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. What's the Bible saying? Mom, dad, God is expecting you to pass on an inheritance to your children's children, Okay, how do you do that if you keep giving it all away? Don't do that. Let me be really clear about this. If somebody told me, Pastor Richard, I've got this great business. Uh, it earns a million dollars a year, Pastor Richard. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sell that business and I'm gonna give all the money to the church. I would say, please don't do that. I, I'm, please don't do that. Please just let that business keep running and give a portion of that income for the next 50 years to the church or to your family or to whoever, please don't give it all away. It's not great stewardship, friends. It's, it, it doesn't, I know it sounds very spiritual, but it's actually not, okay? We've gotta save. Now, did you know that this, there's a phenomenon going on, it started in America, it's spreading around the world, and it's, it's called people are going skiing, skiing. What, what is skiing? Well, people are spending the kids' inheritance. Yeah. And they're proud of themselves that they're taking all the money that they've accumulated over the years and they refuse to hand it over to the kids because they can just build their own wealth. We're going to go on cruises and trips and buy jet skis and cars we can't afford and we're going to do all that because the kids can fend for themselves. Friends, it's not biblical and it's not the pathway for, for generations. No, no, the Bible says that we should be accumulating wealth. Now, of course, mum, dad, go spend some money and go on that trip, but, but don't make it your aim to spend the kids' inheritance. Are you hearing me? Do you know what? There's another phenomenon called uh, die broke. Die broke. In other words, spend every last dollar you've got and then die. And some people would go, yeah, good on you, mate. You, you earned it. You spend it. Enjoy your life. No, friends. Imagine we can set our kids up that they can have the jobs they love rather than the jobs they have to have. Imagine your kids could have a life where they're choosing what they want to do based on a call rather than, I've got to do this because I've got no money. No, no, come on, let's set our kids up, friends. Be praying into your wealth. Be praying that your grandchildren will say, hey, mum, dad, how, how come we're so blessed? Because grandma and grandpa were thinking about you. Come on, someone, get excited. We should be handing over wealth to the generations. You know, and I'm, I'm in a room full of people right now, and I'm just looking around, and I'm just seeing some of these young families, and, and I can see already where they're headed. They're already investing. They're already saving their money, and I can see that God is blessing them. They're growing in their wealth. They're growing in their knowledge, and you know what? Their kids are going to be blessed. That gives me a lot of joy, friends, because imagine what they could do and what blessing they could be to the world as we keep moving forward. Come on, someone, get excited about that. Hey, listen, listen to this statement. This is a, this is a quote. Wealthy people don't earn a lot of money. It's, it's, it's a mistake. Oh, if you're wealthy, you earn a lot of money. I have seen that to not be true. This is the honest truth. Wealthy people save a lot of money. Yeah. Now, friends, I used to have a job where I used to help people buy investment properties. This is back in the day. And, you know, I used to deal with barristers, barristers 
who were earning 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars and honestly they were struggling struggling and I remember my boss saying that he said hey some of these guys don't have two coins to rub together and I went oh as if I'm telling you it was true and then there was this girl who worked for Virgin in, in, in their cabin crew and she was wealthier than what they were why because she knew how to save friends learn how to save stewarding seeding saving learn how to save. And if you don't know how to do that, I'm telling you, I can connect you with some great people, some great organizations that can help you move forward. Come on, someone, get excited. Amen. Invest. Invest, this is still a part. I've got only a couple of minutes left because the, the last one, to be quite honest, I think is quite obvious, okay? But this one, this one here is important. Friends, learn to invest. You know, I'm seeing a lot of young people at the moment and they're buying $30,000 cars. Rather than investing 30000 they're spending it on a car. Now, do you understand that cars depreciate, okay? Investment moves you forward. I, I, I jumped on the, uh, the, the government website today, Smart Money, and, and I typed in $30,000, so I typed in $30,000 over 40 years, okay, adding, adding $100 per month, okay? Anyone can put $100 a month aside. Do you know what you end up with if you take your 30000 that you were going to spend on a car, only add $100 per month, do you know what you end up with in 40 years? A million dollars from the 30000 A million dollars. Do it yourself, okay? What am I saying to you today? Friends, start thinking about the future. It's godly to do that. Jesus said that he was disappointed in the person that he gave a talent to, and what did they do? They just went and hid it in the ground. He said, at least you should have put it into the bank and earned interest on it. That's what your savior told that guy to do. He said, you were being wicked and lazy because you didn't even earn interest on it. Now, of course, he was talking about gifts and talents and the way you use your life. I get all that. But why did Jesus use the money illustration? Because I think he believed that as well. Okay, come on, let's get smart about this. All right, there's the, there's, there's the four buckets and we're gonna get them all right. Okay, now the... The fourth one, I think we understand. So if you've stewarded the 10th, the first 10th, then you've seeded some money, and then you have uh, saved your money, okay? Then you need to spend some money, of course, okay? You need to pay your rent, or you need to pay your mortgage, you, you need to buy food, you need to buy clothes. Actually, that's a point right there. Some of you, can you please buy a new tie? Like, if I say that tie one more time, I'm gonna strangle you with it, okay? Right, seriously, like... Get some new clothes, right? Okay, so you, you, you are allowed to spend some money here, okay? But friends, how are you spending the money? Are you just squandering the wealth that you do have? Because let's say you've saved. You go, I've saved, but now I'm just going to squander. No, no, don't, don't do that. Teach your children how to spend money. Tell them the value of money. You know, when we, Helen and I used to go on holidays, so that our kids, I mean, well, actually, let me back up. How many of you know when you go on holidays, your kids constantly, mom, dad, I want to buy an ice cream. I want to buy some chocolate. I want to buy some lollies. I want to buy. And so you're just constantly reaching for money, constantly reaching. And they would just stress you out the whole time. And, and you know what? Who knows how much money they would actually spend over that time? We, we, you know what? We changed our philosophy. We thought, you know what? We've landed at the Gold Coast and our kids were young and we would give them all $100 each. That's a lot of money, to be honest, for a five-day holiday. So we'd give them $100 each and then we'd say to them, you can spend it all today and you've got nothing left or you can save it all and not buy anything and you can keep it for when you go back to Melbourne or you can spend $50 and, and save 50 You can do whatever you like. Well, let me just tell you, number one, they didn't harass us anymore, right? Because they got their money. That was it. So stress-free holiday. But do you know what was amazing is, is the philosophy of they were so happy to spend that money when we were just dishing it out but as soon as we gave it to them and we said, you be responsible for it, it's amazing how they didn't want to buy that ice cream anymore. They didn't want to buy those lollies anymore. Now they were very keen to save and to buy something of significance, right? What am I saying to you? You know what? I see my children now and they still have that same philosophy. They are, they're not just massive spenders because we taught them as little kids, you be responsible for money. You start thinking about your money. And I've got to be honest, I think they're doing really, really well. And I just want to challenge you. Are you teaching your kids about money? Are you helping them so that they don't just squander their wealth and never move ahead to be able to fulfill the dreams on the, in their life? Amen? So listen, live simply, friends. Yes, you can 
you know, I've got lovely guitars at home and, and, and I even had a lovely car. But I, you know what? When, when push came to shove, I sold it so that I could take that money and put it into something that will actually grow in value. Hear what I'm saying here. Come on. Let's get smart about our money. Don't let money happen to you. Okay? You happen to money. All right? You dictate where it goes. Don't let it dictate where it's going to go. You tell it where it's going to go and be blessed and move forward. Now, we told you in this series, friends, this whole series isn't about give your money. It's actually, in some cases, don't give your money. Honor God, yes. Honor God, yes. But friends, in some cases, you need to pull up. You need to really be thinking about how are you going to move forward, amen? So this is how I want to end this message. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for those four buckets, and you need to ask yourself, which one of those buckets are a challenge to you? Which ones do you need some wisdom on? Now, listen, you're in a great church where we can connect you to great people who will help you with every one of those buckets, okay? But which one do you need help with? Do you need some more education? Do you need, do you need a spirit of self-control, okay? So come on, I want you to bow your head right now, wherever you are, because I want to pray that you are able to give an inheritance to your children's children. Come on, bow your head with me. Father, I thank you for everyone that is watching right across the globe, God, right now. And Lord, we're not going to pretend that money doesn't matter. It does. Money says to vision, I can fulfill you. And money says to calling that I can live you out. And so Father God, right now, I just pray for everyone that is watching. Father God, Lord, we put you as God of all over our finances. You are Lord over our finances and we submit ourselves to you. And I pray, Father God, that this message will be seared upon people's hearts as they understand that there is a time, there is a time to steward and to seed and to save and then of course to spend as well. Father God, bless us as we move forward in our finances. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before we close, I know that there are some people watching and this has been great and it's helped you in, in that area of your life. But friends, can I be honest? You know, you're gonna need a spirit of self-control. You're gonna need the Holy Spirit to direct you. And for some of you watching right now, you, if you were honest, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I just wanna give you an invitation right now to just simply open up your heart and say, Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive me of all my sin and help me build a relationship with you that lasts for all eternity. Friends, if you would just pray that prayer, Jesus will come with his power, with his forgiveness, with his peace. He will fill you from the inside out and fill you with joy regardless of what's going on around the world. Friends, he wants to come into your life. Would you let him do that today? And friends, if you do pray that prayer, we would just love to know about it and to be able to connect with you and, and walk that journey with you. Amen. In Jesus' name, I'm going to welcome my, my wife up here with me right now. Come on up here, young lady. How good is it that we can be live? It's fantastic. Straight into people's lounge rooms. Man, we miss you guys. I know that for many of us, we're in lockdown right now, and there are some aspects that are fun. I get to see you a lot more. Yeah. Um, but you know what? For a lot of us, you know, this, this, is, this is not great. So I was just going to ask, would you, would you pray for us as a nation? Yeah. Um, even around the world, those that are watching, who knows what's going on? Come on, let's pray for people right where they are in their homes. Yes. So come on, Father God, we thank you that you are for us, that you are mighty, that you are powerful, Lord. And right now we ask that, that this virus would just be put to rest, that yes. it would yes. just die off, that it would settle down and be yes, gone Lord. so that every border can be opened, every, every connection can be remade, every church door can have its full capacity, Father God, right across our thank nation, you, right across the earth. Father, we pray thank for you, opportunity you, to share your love. Thank you, Father. Lord, that as Christians, we get to carry your hope and your grace and your kindness and your love, Lord, and Thank that you, you would Jesus. give us opportunity to share it Amen. as we're connecting with people, as we're talking to people, Lord, on Facebook, Amen. on Instagram, that we would be the carriers of your love and your hope. Thank you, Lord, Father. we pray for your blessing upon your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, it's great to have been with you today. Please send the link. Uh, of today's message to somebody yeah. that you think it will help them. Otherwise, we are hoping to be together live. If you are in Melbourne, we are hoping to be together live next week, but who knows what's going to happen. But either way, you can still connect with us online. We love you guys. Have an amazing day. God bless you.